Words have power to inform us. Words have power to misinform us. Words communicate ideas. Ideas that can make us happy or sad. Words can cause joy or fear, peace or anger, celebration or mourning. Words can change our minds. Words can change our behavior. For words are the weapons of the false teachers. Peter uses words, therefore, to guard the people of God from the poison of heresy. If we fail to keep watch, if we fail to guard ourselves, what happens? The lack of a proper watch results in believing the lies of the false teachers. When you stop believing the promises of God and you start listening and believing the false teachers and their message that God has failed in his promise, you are being led astray from the truth. You are being led astray from the way of holiness. You are being led astray into the error of the wicked. I have seen too many of God's people ripped off from ripped from their stability by false teachers because we forget the gospel and we begin telling ourselves lies about what the promises of God mean to us we find ourselves too attached to that which will burn rather than being attached to that which will last forever we begin to grow unstable. And we wonder why. It's because we have forgotten the truth. Whether it is the reasonable tone or the possibility of sin that attracts us to the false teachers without keeping our guard, we will be tempted by the message. Whether it is their reasonable speech or the, the attraction of the ability to justify our own sin without a true understanding of the promises of God we will find their way tempting. And we have examples throughout church history of how professing Christians have found themselves drawn away into sin by reasonable arguments of false teachers. Satan and the false teachers have this objective to tear us off our rock and to place and to have us place our trust in something else. The objective of the evil one, the objective of the wicked, is to take our eyes off of the stability and the promises of God, to take our hope off of that, and to get us to place our hope and trust in something else. We need to be on guard. There is a place to which I am headed that matters more to me than all of the things that are in this life of vanity and sin and misery that will all burn. Beloved, in Jesus Christ, we need regular reminders that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Let me tell you something. Being a pastor oftentimes isn't the funnest job in the world. Most of the time, it can be not the funnest job in the world. You have to deal with a whole bunch of sinners and their sin. In fact, your chief job really is to look at the heart of darkness and everyone in the room, a whole bunch of sinners. You as the pastor have the privilege, put that in air quotes, of knowing basically all of the dirt of the people. And you have to love them and minister them and be with them in all of their heart, day after day, week after week. You have to be able to survive that. You have to have a, an attitude and a, and a personality and a, and a desire to be that God. Why would you ever do that? Let me tell you something. I hope that as, you, as I have talked about the pastoral office, you've gotten a clear indication of that it's not the funnest thing in the world to do. That it's not necessarily an enviable position for you to take. 
The pastoral office is not the pathway to wealth and prosperity. It's not a pathway to an easy life. If you're doing the pastoral office in an easy life kind of way, let me tell you something, you're doing it wrong. It's not supposed to be that way. And if you're doing it that way, you're doing it wrong, and probably you know, should fear the frightful judgment of the Lord on you for that. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. The United States has a deep detestation for the idea of slavery. slavery. Why do we have such a passionate antipathy towards slavery? slavery? Three words. The Civil War. I mean, seriously, when you have a country that basically tears itself apart and uh, destroys 50 500,000 souls or more, you can imagine that this country has some kind of negative attitude toward the idea of slavery. And whether or not you conclude that the war was caused by slavery or a state's rights, the polarizing event or the polarizing idea which caused the war was slavery. slavery. Not the nature of slavery practiced in the United States, but the very concepts in general, or so it has been come to be understood. For most of us were taught in school at least that the Civil War was fought not over the kind of slavery that the United States practiced, but over slavery in general. And so when you have this kind of background, the Bible proves to be difficult to understand on this issue because it does not forbid or criticize the practice of slavery. In fact, the Old Testament gave specific instructions on how the institution ought to operate. All the argument regarding uh, the archaic culture does not change the fundamental problem. Slavery as an idea does not conflict with Christian ethics. Indentured servitude is not a sin. For most of us, that probably, our minds are probably exploding. Now, before any of you run out and say, Pastor Bennett is recommending that we all go back to slavery, that is not what I'm saying. We should not. For the free exchange of labor proves to be effective in reducing production costs, if nothing else. It is not talking about employers and employees. It's talking about masters and slaves. In that culture, uh, you could be quite prosperous as a slave. So you could be a slave and work as a CEO of a thriving business living relatively independently in relative luxury in the first century. But some in the first audience were not CEOs living in luxury, though are what we think of when we talk about slavery. Their humanity was in question, they were considered possessions. There's parts of, you know, when we talk about slavery in the first century, as distinct from slavery as, was, as it was practiced in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, there's, in terms of principles, there's not a lot of principles that were, were different. There's a lot of practices that were grossly wrong. But the principles, the principles were, were similar. similar. We are familiar with the disreputable history of slavery as it was practiced in the United States. And believe me, when I say that slavery as an idea is not unbiblical, I have no interest in defending slavery as reflects in the United States. There is a completely biblical reason why that was completely illegitimate, and we can talk about that. In a sense, by talking about masters and slaves, and the duties of slaves, it says a lot more to us. If a slave was to 
live and obey in this and his circumstance, what must it mean to us who aren't? We are excellent at outward obedience with a bad attitude. In the workplace, we may follow orders, but that doesn't stop us from thinking that our bosses are complete idiots. Paul reminds us that attitude matters as well as integrity. Paul commands servants to obey their masters in verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. You could use the term slave and lord instead of servant and master. In fact, uh, MacArthur in his book Slave makes the argument that one of the greatest uh, uh, propaganda, deceitful use of the Bible was transferring, uh, translating the word doulos uh, into servant in King James Version and subsequent versions instead of slave. And there are reasons why in the 20th century we are not all that interested in going back to using the term slave. That the obedience to human authority is a subset of Christian obedience to Jesus. That as wives are to submit to their husbands, they are to do so as a subset of their submission to Christ. As children are to obey their parents, they are to do so as a subset of their obedience to Christ. And as servants are to obey their masters, they do so as a subset of their obedience to Jesus as well. And so God commands the servants to obey their masters with fear and trembling, with singleness of purpose, understanding that their work is not ultimately in obedience to their master, but obedience to Jesus. The life's work of the employee is a service to God. We work for Jesus. All our labor is kingdom labor in whatever field he may place us. It doesn't matter if you are president of the United States, an attorney, a doctor, a lawyer, Indian chief, Indian chief. Anything that God has called you to do is kingdom work, for we are all ultimately slaves of Christ Jesus. The people who aren't Christians work for something earthly. We work for a different reason than an earthly medium of exchange. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same he shall receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. You're not working for that guy who owns you. You're working for Jesus. In this world, everyone, everybody may be working for the weekend, or others are working for money, 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 money. We work for a different reason. We obey and labor oftentimes unnoticed because we have understood the gospel. Only the truth of salvation in Christ and the indescribable love of God shown in our hearts can explain our labor. You will never know your full potential as a human being until you first solve your isolation from God. As all babies are born with unrealized potential, they are also born with a foundational barrier in their separation from God. Your sin is completely destructive and soul-crushing. It offends God's honor and will lead you to the torments of hell. That's why the Bible calls you a slave of sin in the worst possible context of that term. The world wants independent wives, weak husbands, rebellious children, clueless parents, grumbling workers, and draconian employers. The Lord commands a different model. Submissive wives, sacrificial husbands, obedient children, parents who are training in Christ, employees that work hard, and employers that promote humanity. This model is the gospel and its transformative impact in our lives. For the gospel reminds you that you were once a slave to sin. But now, you're a slave of Christ. That might not sound like a great bargain. Once a slave of sin, now a slave of Christ. Until you realize that a slave of Christ defines what it is to be free. Limits do not always restrict freedom. This is something that is contrary to our understanding, for we think of limits as something that restrains our freedom. But remember, ultimate freedom is found in a limit. Ultimate freedom is found in an inability. An inability to sin. Ultimate freedom is found in heaven when we are not able to sin. And these roles guide us away from sin. They guide us into freedom. So therefore, let us live pursuing that freedom in Christ.
For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The emphasis of this verse is plainly on the abandonment of man's pride or work in salvation. Paul is saying, you had nothing to do with it. You can't do it. It is not of you. You can't do it. It is the gift of God. And then this postmodern word, a lot of people are trusting in something that is other than the truth. There is a lack of this notion that there is a truth to which we must acknowledge that it is the truth. Salvation by grace through faith. That does not deny the truth that faith is a gift, but puts it in the context of the total package. You get the grace, you get the salvation, but wait, there's more. You can't do it. Because you were so helpless, you also get the faith as well. Because you were so dead, you couldn't reach out your hand to receive the gift. God gives, it to, gives you the faith that you need as well. You can't do it. You had to get it from God, for there was no way that you could have received it on your own because you were dead. We may possess the facility of faith just as we may possess a hand. But without the regenerating power of God, we remain dead and we can no more exercise the faith we need to save us than a dead man could stretch forth his hand to receive a gift. You can't do it. Some people have illustrated faith this way in asserting man's free will to receive the gift of God on his own, on his own energy and power and resources. But that makes no sense, it makes as much sense as a man in his coffin is able to reach up and grab a gift offered to him. Salvation is a gift, and God gives his chosen power, the chosen people, the ability to receive it. We did not save ourselves. We did not deserve salvation. God did it for us. We have all done that which is wrong, and we all deserve hell. And none of that matters anymore because Jesus. That is to be the foundational way we see ourselves, not by your human effort. For our friends in the Armenian camp, they have to take this as a mosaic issue, but that would be a mistranslation, a misunderstanding of this word. Paul is saying, you can't do it. It is not by your works. Your deadness precludes such a thing from happening. Because you are spiritually dead, you and your effort cannot achieve your salvation. We cannot take credit for any part of our salvation. You can't do it. The passionate assertion that man exercises faith and the refusal to accept predestination eviscerates any claim that faith does not give a man a right to boast. In the Arminian world, the people who assert that they have they can exercise faith and do so so vehemently against predestination give a lie to their assertion that there is nothing to boast of on faith. If there was nothing to boast about for their faith, why do they cling to it so tenaciously? Why do they keep talking about it? Because Paul is saying in verse 9 that your human effort doesn't contribute anything to salvation. salvation. God instituted salvation in such a way that excluded the glory of man that his glory might shine. God's glory should be the most important object of our lives. Everything else should go away. Every decision we make should be made with that purpose. How does what I do glorify God? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We are not saved for our own pleasure. God does not justify us because we deserve it. He does so for his own glory. We are recipients of his grace so that we may be the trophies of his love. What is it that you pray for? What you pray for reveals a lot about where your priorities lie. Do you 
pray that God's glory would be made manifest in your life. Are you doing anything to make that happen? Are you doing what you do because it glorifies God? And does obedience matter because of that? Is obeying God just the best way to live, the easiest way to live, or do we obey God because it shows forth His glory? That as you were elected in Christ before the foundation of the world, so in that time before the foundation of the world, He also decreed the good works that you should perform. Those who do evil will perish in hell. God's judgment falls upon all types of sin. And Paul gives you those types when he says, Be not deceived in the next verse, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. You deserve hell for any sexual activity outside of marriage. You deserve hell when you value anything above God. You deserve hell for your homosexual activity. You deserve hell for taking anything that is not yours. You deserve hell for coveting what is not yours. You deserve hell for ever using, for ever using food, drink, drugs to excess to the loss of control. You deserve hell for speaking evil against other people. You deserve hell for not having compassion on your fellow human beings. You deserve hell for robbing God. In short, every person under the sound of my voice deserves hell, hell even. Hell. You may be all of these things and even worse, but as the meme said, none of that matters because Jesus. That's the gospel. I am telling you that the eternal consequences of your sin will vanish as you believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Let this be a time of joy and celebration and wonder as we are struck afresh and anew with the awe of what God has done for and through and to us. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And if the righteousness scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? I still vividly remember one night when both of my roommates told me, in no uncertain terms, with no kind of softening edge to the fact that, in their opinion, I was not normal. And over the years, I don't think that I have really tried to be normal, whatever that is, at least not consciously. Instead, I have learned to kind of tune out or to ignore the sounds of criticism, the implied ostracism of those in the world who say this is what it means to be normal and you are not it. There are groups of which I am not and probably will never be included in. There will be groups of which I will not be welcome because they will not think that I am normal. And you might be able to relate to my survival tactic of ignoring the voices that uh, reject you, the slights and the exclusions and ostracisms. We choose this approach because often we seek to avoid the pain of being excluded. And I want us to lower our barriers uh, this week for just a moment. So stop ignoring the implied insults and ostracisms. We are those who indeed are beginning to understand what it means to suffer for Christ. We have just been become very practiced at times in ignoring it because the world ignores us. The world treats us as abnormal. Our opinions do not matter and are often immediately considered invalid because we get them from the Bible. We are not only considered to be weirdos, we are considered to be the weirdos that are ruining life. Instead of ignoring suffering, instead of ignoring the ostracism and the insults and the rebukes, the Apostle calls upon us to accept it as a Christian. There's something in suffering to appreciate. We often do not associate the pain of suffering with the idea of glory. The insults of the world do not strike us as a, the way in which God is being glorified. In our failure, we have forgotten the life and the nature of our Savior. 
Do we, have we forgotten that what the world did to Jesus? And Peter reminds us that suffering is to be expected because it shows that we are in union with Jesus. The world is trying to drag us down by their insults, by their ignoring us. The Lord is doing something different. Peter's answering the question, why does God allow his people to be hated and mocked? Peter answers by saying, because it proves our faith. It is that which tests, tests us. And the idea of fire reminds us of the proving of metal, the removing of impurities. This is what Peter is talking about, not a test that we are intended to fail, a test that we are intended to pass, a test that makes us more like Jesus. There's no sense of masochism here where we are to say, yay, we're going through bad times. That's insanity. That's not what God's word says at all. But when hard times come, when suffering comes, when the world hates you, we remember that, he ha- that they hated our Savior first. If they hate us, then that means they must be seeing our Savior in us as well. It is because you have taken upon the name of Christ, people don't listen to you, they ignore you, they rebel against you, they keep you, they exclude you. When these things happen, for the name of Christ, you are blessed. We are seeing within the world around us that the culture that surrounded us that used to be very pro-Christian is becoming quickly very anti-Christian. And Christians have acted as if the new state of affairs was shocking and unexpected. And Peter does not allow that to be our response. Reproaches for the name and for the sake of Jesus is normal. Why did the pilgrims and the Puritans come to the new world? Because they were being reproached for the sake of Christ. We rejoice that we have been chosen by God and privileged to participate in the sufferings and the glory of Jesus, our Savior. And yet, for those who believe in the sovereignty of God and His providence, we are those who should be living with the most hope. Peter says, if, it, if we have begun to experience through our suffering, for, through our reproaches, for Christ's sake, the judgment, the refining of us, what will the world experience? What is the judgment that they will face on the last day? I didn't make that up. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, Blessed are ye when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. You know the story. You deserve hell. Jesus died and took the hell for all his people. And when you think of that story, are you a part of it? Do you believe that what Jesus did, he did for you?